I have something here. I have the six purposes of schooling as laid down in 1917 by the man who Harvard named their honor lecture in education for. So far from being a fringe individual, this guy is the reason the Harvard Honor Lecture in Education is named as it is. The Ingalls Lecture looks like Inglis, but it's pronounced Ingalls. And I would like to read you the six purposes of schooling. I moved heaven and earth, and it took years to find this book, just like trying to find in past years a copy of Carol Quigley's Tragedy and, and Hope. I learned about Ingalls from the 20-year president of Harvard, uh, James Bryan Conant, who was a poison gas specialist in World War I was a very inner circle of the atomic bomb project, World War II, was the high commissioner of occupied Germany after the war. So he wrote, oh, there must be 20 books about the institution of schooling, of which he was completely uh, a proponent. And I forced, he's a very, very bad writer, I forced myself to read most of these books, and in one of them, he says that if you really want to know what school is about, you need to pick up the book that I'm referring to here, Principles of Secondary Education. Two years it took me to find a copy of the book, 750 pages, tiny print, and as dull as you, your imagination can conceive, and furthermore, it's not until you get to the very middle of the book, in an unlabeled section, that he spills the beans. Let me spill them for you. These are the six purposes or functions, as he calls them. The first he calls the adjustive function. Schools are to establish fixed habits of reaction to authority. That's their main purpose, habits of reaction to authority. That's why school authorities don't tear their hair out when somebody exposes that uh, uh, that the atomic bomb wasn't dropped on Korea as a uh, history book in 1990s printed by Scott Forsman distributed, and why each of these books has hundreds of substantive errors. Learning isn't the reason the texts are distributed. So first is the adjustive function, fixed habits. Now, here comes the wonderful insight that being able to, th to analyze the detail will give you. How can you establish whether someone has successfully developed this automatic reaction? Because people have a proclivity when they're given sensible orders to follow it. That's not what they want to reach. The only way you can measure this is to give stupid orders and people automatically follow those. Now you've achieved function one. Have you ever wondered why some of the foolish things schools do are allowed to continue? Number two he calls, he calls it the integrating function, but it's easier to understand if you call it the conformity function. It's to make children as alike as possible, the gifted children and the stupid as alike as possible, because market research uses statistical sampling, and it only works if people react generally the same way. The third function he calls the directive function. 
School is to diagnose your proper social role and then to log the evidence that here's where you are in the Great Pyramid so that future people won't allow you to escape that compartment. The fourth function is the differentiating function. Because once you've diagnosed kids in this layer, you do not want them to learn anything that the higher layers are learning. So you teach just as far as the requirements of that layer. Number five and six are the creepiest of all. Number five is the selective function. What that means is what Darwin meant by natural selection. You're assessing the breeding quality of each individual kid. You're doing it structurally because school teachers don't know this is happening. And you're trying to use ways to prevent the poor stuff from breeding, and those ways are hanging labels, humiliating labels around their neck, encouraging the shallowness of thinking, you know. I often wondered, because I came from a very, very strict Scotch-Irish culture that never allowed you to leer at a girl. Well, when I got to New York City, the boys were pawing the girls openly, and there was really no redress for the girls at all, except not showing up in the classroom. You know, high absentee rates. Well, you're supposed to teach structurally that th that sexual pleasure is what y you withdraw from a relationship, and everything else is a waste of time and expensive. So the selective function is what Darwin meant by the favored races. The idea is to consciously improve the breeding stock. Schools are meant to tag the unfit with their inferiority by poor grades, remedial placement, humiliation, so that their peers will accept them as inferior. And the good breeding stock among the females will reject them as possible partners. And the sixth is the creepiest of all, and I think it's partly what Tragedy and Hope is about. It's a fancy Roman name, the propydeutic function. Because as early as Roman big-time thinkers, it was understood that to continue a social form required some people being trained that they were the custodians of this. So some small fraction of the kids are being ready to take over the project. That's the guy, the honor lecture, and it will not surprise you that his ancestors include the major general at the Siege of Lucknow in India, famous for tying the mutineers on the muzzles of the cannons and blowing them apart, or somebody who had, was forced to flee New York City, a churchman because, at, at the beginning of the American Revolution, because he wrote a refutation of Thomas Paine's common sense. They were going to tar and feather him. He fled and was rewarded by the British by making him the Bishop of Nova Scotia. Those are Ingalls' ancestors. <laughs> so Al Ingalls is certainly... When I learned of this and wrote to Harvard asking for access to the Ingalls Lecture, strike me dead, Lord, if I'm exaggerating at all, I was told, well, we have no, there is no Ingalls Lecture, hasn't been for years, and we have no records. 
It was the same thing that happened when I discovered that uh, Elwood P. Coverley, the most influential schoolman of the 20th century and the bionomics genius, had been the elementary school editor of Houghton Mifflin and I wrote out in Mifflin, if there are any records, and they said, we have no record of anyone named Elwood P. Coverley. Now Harvard's telling me there's no Ingalls lecture. A week passed, and I got a call from Harvard, from some obscure office at Harvard, saying, what, what is your interest in the Ingalls lecture? <laughs> I knew that I was on thin ice. And I said, well, uh, James Conant referred me in his books to the man the Ingalls Lecture is named after. And I was wondering if I could get some background on this fellow and a list of the lectures. And in due time, I got a list of the lectures and instructions how to access the texts, but not easily. You know, enough hoops that someone who has to mow the lawn and burp the baby, you know, wouldn't jump through those hoops. Uh, I was able to prove Harper's wouldn't publish when they did the cover essay I wrote, which Lou Latham named Against School, probably after Jeremiah's Against. But I had called uh, uh, the artificial extension of childhood because I think that's the key mechanism at, at, at work here. So. They wouldn't print the information about uh, uh, Coverley because how Mifflin denied it. It was only months afterward that I looked through my extensive library of incredibly dull books about schooling and opened in the facing page, said Elwood Coverley, editor-in-chief, elementary school, uh, publishing arm of, uh, of Howard Mifflin, by the way, the secondary editor-in-chief was Alexander Ingalls. So you see how, how this cousinage, the incest, works.